Ka tērā koe o tira, tērā koutou, uh, koutou i whakarau o mai nei ki tērā i whakātura ngā nāku e pāna ki ngā rau emi, um, kai roto i te whare, whare nei i kia nei ko te akamauri. Um, welcome, welcome to this presentation uh, about some of the resources that we'll find inside Te Akamauri, especially for those who are involved in, say, Waitangi Tribunal um, issues or Māori land research, any research in those kind of areas. Um, this presentation will hopefully talk about some of the resources that they may be able to help you in those areas, those and those and related areas, of course. Um, my name's Ben. I'm a historical researcher, have been for many years now. Although my specialty tends to be land, uh, I've researched in other areas as well. Uh, and Akamodi, Takamodi has always been a place that I've, I've used um, when researching. All right, let's get into it. Um, in Team Matanga, here at our beginning, so for Waitangi research, Māori land research, or you know, really any research, it is useful to start with a subject and a question or questions. The subject will usually fit into one of the following. It might be um, a person, um, it might be people, you know, people of society or a hapu or an iwi. Um, it might be a, a place, a wahi, uh, a particular area, uh, or it might be a particular practice or behaviour that you're looking into, um, a tikanga, a kawa. Um, or it could be an event. Um, something that had happened at a particular um, point in time. The questions could be many. Um, and for example, here's, here's a few questions um, that have come out of those subjects. Um, a few questions that have popped up that I've seen over the years. You know, did, did my iwi sign the treaty? Um, who sold that land block? What was this thing, that, the tent owner rule, what's that? Who owns the homestead? Where can I find a map of that area? How come auntie has more shares than mum? How do we succeed? Um, what was the Thermal Springs Act? What was the Fenton Agreement? What was Mum's Ely? What's Dad's Ely? You know, all of that, all of those kind of things could be questions that you may be thinking of. The reason why questions are important is they provide the focus and the emptus. Yeah, they provide the focus that you need to track the information that aligns to it, that answers it. Um, but it also provides you a bit of a push, a bit of an emptus to travel to keep on going forward. But having questions is one thing, knowing who or where to go to get the answer. Well, that's, hey, that's another question. <laughs> that's its own kind of issue. Ideally, your first support of cause would include um, looking through whānau papers and ask your whānau and go home and talk to your elders. Um, and this works really well. You know, it's a bit like checking your own backyard before you go searching because you don't want to double up your search. Uh, the worst thing you could do is find a whole bunch of information that someone else in the family already had. Um, I know sometimes it can be difficult, it, a lot of it depends on um, the dynamics, whānau dynamics and iwi dynamics, um, and your relationship with whānau and iwi. Um, you kind of look at this as a way to um, push you to, to build um, relationships with, with whānau and with iwi. Um, but I know that some people can find that very, very hard, or maybe there's absolutely no relationship. You know, you, you've, you've been brought up far away, mum and dad were brought up far away, so there's no easy link back home. So exhausting the bump, your next port of call might be the internet, or oh, Papa Google, Facebook, wherever. Um, not that they're the most ideal sources, but they are the most um, easily accessible, I suppose, um, sources that you have to you. Uh, and there's some really cool things on there, don't get me wrong. The internet's a really, really useful place um, for getting some initial whakaro, um, scraps of information, sometimes lots of information. Um, and then after that, of course, there's um, wherever your public library is, for it's Te uh, In the old days, Te would have been number four, uh, number three, sorry. Um, but of course, the world's changed. We all tend to be um, online literate, um, so that tends to be the place that we go to first. Uh, so I'll put um, your public library, wherever it is, um, as number four, as one of our sources of knowledge. Um, and Te kind of acts as a puna. Um, it's, a, it's a source of information, there's information it holds, um, but there's also information that um, it has on linkages out of Te Akamori into other places, into other forums. So not only can you get some really cool information there, but they can show you how to link into other places. Like, you know, there's internal affairs, births, deaths and marriages they look after. Um, yep, there's some databases that you're going to find in the, in the genealogical um, kind of area of Te Akamori. 
Um, but then you might, eventually at some point, you may need to engage um, with internal affairs, births, deaths and marriages. Um, this is a way to, to learn how to best to do that and take some information so you can do that effectively. Um, they also look after national archives, uh, you know, which is the, the memory, I suppose, the archive of government and government departments. And government departments, all of them have um, would have interacted with people you're researching at one time or another. Um, so that's a really good place to check it out too. Um, Waitangi Tribunal, of course, they have many reports um, online and in their archives. They can be very, very useful. National Library, um, same with um, like a bigger version, I suppose, of Te Komodi, um, has things from across the nation. Um, some of it unique that you can't find anywhere else. Te Koti Whenua Māori, the Māori Land Court, um, we'll speak of a little bit later. Alexander Turnbull Library, um, all the various museums, including Te Papa, um, all of these places, you know, the, the places that you can go to after you've done a, a, a good search of Te Akamori, and Te Akamori may help you um, reach out to them um, in some way or form with, with information that you've found. All right, so Te Akamori is kind of, I call it the first port of call um, when you get into that research space away from Farno, um, and that can lead you to these other places as well. Um, but why, eh? Libraries. Um, so libraries are important as they provide access to information and education to everyone. They offer knowledge, entertainment, special programs, access to the internet and countless other unique resources. Uh, so when I used to go to the library, my mum used to take me to the library and those kind of things, uh, the library was very much fiction, non-fiction, um, books, and when I was a kid I tended to spend most of my time in, in the fiction area, reading those kind of books, um, and then they usually had um, one public computer, which um, kids usually play games on to be honest um it's very very different now um especially those libraries in in um small cities like our own like Rotorua they tend to be more almost like a public um or community hub I suppose and yes they still offer the knowledge stuff but they also do um entertainment sometimes they put on shows um all of those kind of things sometimes they put on um special programs um and some of those are themed around um research um, for Karo, for example, uh, Te Akamori runs a local history week, week, local heritage week at the end of every year. Um, all the libraries nationally run um, a family research kind of month, uh, and they all have really cool kind of programs running and presentations that run around those things. Um, Te Akamori in particular has a good school program where schools come in and can learn things about the library, but also um, about our museum space. Um, and there's countless other unique resources that you can find here as well. So don't think of the library as just fiction, non-fiction, books on a shelf. Um, you know, they kind of really have moved on since then. Um, they're no longer the quiet, um, shush and don't talk kind of areas. Uh, Te Akamori is often buzzy, um, especially with the kids area um, being so energetic uh, on the ground floor there. Um, and they kind of floats through the entire complex really so it's not the gone are the days where it's just be quiet sit at a corner and read a book um you know in, in, a, in a dark area um so you know kind of put that 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 old school for out of your mind um libraries generally should provide uh, what should be a warm welcoming atmosphere where people can gather and learn um and welcoming is really important you shouldn't feel that um uh, people are, are judging you or watching you. you you'll find in Takamori that's not, not the case. You just set up set up shop wherever you want to set up shop and people will generally leave you alone unless you need help. Um, so the library should provide access to information and resources, many of which are rare, specialised or localised, which may not be available online or indeed anywhere else. Uh, the good thing about local local libraries and, and, and cities and towns is that they will have a unique collection that's tailored towards their area, wherever they are. Right, they tend to have the most information on the area, um, far beyond what you'll find at National Library. Right? So that's, that's really important. It's a specialised, it's localised. Um, libraries should be a safe space for learning research with few distractions. Now, you, you could research at home, um, but you won't have access to those resources. Um, and you'll be distracted, let's be fair. If we research at home, we tend to be distracted. You set yourself up in a little, um, at, a, at a table at Te Akamori, um, you're there for the duration for whatever co you're researching. You're not going to be as distracted as you would be at home, but you probably just want to do the dishes or vacuum and, and that kind of stuff, right? So it's good to get out of your, your area and research in a place that's made for research. Um, 
a library is a place where you can meet and ask help from staff. So the staff are very friendly. Um, if you need some help with anything, uh, they'll do what they can to help you. Yeah. Um, it's also a place where you might meet other researchers or like-minded persons in the community. Um, you could bring a friend along and bounce ideas off them, or you may meet someone who happens to be researching in a similar area as you. They can provide information or whakaro that you hadn't thought of. You know, you can bounce all these things off each other. Um, and, you know, no one's going to sit there and go, shush, you guys be quiet, stop talking. That, that's, again, that's old school. That's not how it is now, you know. Um, you have that conversation. You have a corridor, um and see what can come out of it. All right? Chakamodi um, has a little bit of history in it and that the, the library itself has been around since 1889 um, uh, at Ōkonomutu. Then it was moved into town at the, to the Victoria Institute, um, which used to be a building where the family court is today, actually. A uh, very old building used to be sitting there. It was a multi-purpose building. It was actually a community hub of its time. <laughs> and um, the library had a bit of space in there. Um, in October 1940, when uh, the council of the day... Um, built the municipal building which there's a picture of it there um, the library was moved in there so you had the Regent Theatre in the middle originally um, and then you had council offices that were there as well as well as the library and uh, the precursor to the current museum um, used to be there as well just at the back of the library <clears throat> so that was that was in 1940 in 1970 the library moved uh, to temporary premises at the Masonic building on Fenton Street where it remained for about 21 years uh, and that's where I first met this library um, was was at the Masonic building. Uh, the building's still there, of course, um, but that's where the library used to be uh, when I was little and, and visited it with some of the whānau. The former government building between Hopapa and Aro Street was renovated, so the big building was renovated and opened to the public in 1991 as a library. Um, so where the library is today, there used to be um, a number of government offices, um, and then the library was eventually moved in there in 1991. Um, there was a big renovation that was undertaken, um, and Te uh, and was was incorporated into this new Rotorua Library and the Rotorua Children's Health Hub um, in 2018, which is how it is today. Uh, and so I'm sure many of us remember the old library um, was in need of a, an update, and they certainly did a great job of updating the library um, and making it really this community space. So the land on which Tsiakamodi now sits, interestingly enough, was gifted by Ngāti Whakau when the city of Rotorua was established. Um, and in fact that whole area taking in um, the High Court, the Family Court, uh, Pig and Whistle, uh, the Māori Land Court, uh, where the library is today, what uh, Jean Batten Park and the old post office taking in what is today the eyesight, um, all of that area uh, was gifted for government buildings uh, by the iwi at the time. Much of the design and uh, elements within Te Akamori were inspired um, by a mana whenua, who also guided their use. And just I'll just take one example of that, there's many in there, but I'll just take one example. Each floor has its own um, name, health focus, pattern and colour. All of the patterns used in Te Akamori's design have been inspired by tukutuku panels um, within the Whare Runanga, Tamatikapua at Uhunumutu at Te Papauru. Uh, and then you can see here I've got um, examples showing exactly what the colours are and what the patterns are. Alright, so we have our question. Um, so we have something to guide us. We have our impetus to get it done. Um, so where do we start? How do we match with what we want with what Te Akamori has? Um, a good place to start is to ask yourself, hmm, would someone have researched this question before? If your question refers to a particular iwi area or event, might someone have already done some work on it or this area? The library catalogue is the best place to start. Think of it as your library-only Google of every book, magazine, a report, map, and media type held at the library and where to find it in the library. Right, so the catalogue can be accessed online at home um, or, of course, on the computers at the library or, or even on your phone right, while you're wandering around the library. It might take a few tries to get what you want or near to what you want. You have to be strategic in your thinking about um, how you search for it. So rather than searching for who was Fordland's named after, try finding books on World War history and then jumping to the back of those books, reading the index and see if they mention Ford or Fordlands. Right? Also remember not to be too specific in your search, as, and this is a golden rule in research, often less is more and will give you more chances of finding what you want. 
history of Hannah's Bay might give you nothing, whereas Hannah's Bay might give you a better chance to spot something of interest in whatever list that's thrown up. Right? Um, so you can be quite restricted if you just throw in too much. The location of every item um, that the search catalog comes up with will have its own unique Dewey number that you can use to find it, which is essentially its address. That's all it is. The Dewey number is just like an address on the road. Staff will happily help you to navigate the system, but after the first two or three times, believe me, you will get the hang of it. It's quite simple, um, but it's just a matter of, of giving it a go a couple times to, to wrap your head around it. Further, similar books to the one you are looking for will be sitting in the same area, which could provide you with further information. So let's say you look up a book on carving and you see one on the catalog that says um, carving Rotorua carvings or something like that, and you go, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, you go down, you use the Dewey number system to find it, where it is on the bookshelf. You pull it out, look at it, and go, oh, actually, no, it's thick. It doesn't talk about the things that I'm after. It's, it's tourism carving or something. Then you look back down and you'll see other books that are also on carving, and some of them will be on to a carving. Um, and you pull this other book next to it out and go, oh, this is interesting, and it might be carved histories or something. You don't think, ah, oh, this is more what I'm after. So think of the catalog as kind of a gateway to stuff as well. Takamori has a first class, class collection of Māori reference books covering not just Te Aroa, but many other iwi. Um, so, you know, using that Dewey system, you're going to come across what is essentially the Māori collection on the mezzanine floor. Um, and in that collection, you'll see a lot of what I call the, the classics um, of Māori research, especially iwi research. So you'll see things like Don Stafford's Aroa, Mitchell's Takitimu, um, Grace's Tuwharitua, Jones's Naiwi o Tainui, and best to win. Um, and these are great books, they really are. Um, same kind of thing though, they're more uh, more of a gateway to getting to other stuff. Um, they are useful up to a point, um, but you may not find the tupuna that you're after in there, but this will give a context around the tupuna and the iwi that they come from. Um, we're always very careful with these kind of things, um, with this kind of information, um, especially the older books like Tuhoi from Best. Um, Really great for an introduction, I suppose. Um, but you know, you'll meet people from Tuhu who will say, "Well, you know, so some of this stuff isn't quite ticker," um, and that could be with any of these books as well. You know, people have their different versions. But but Elton Best was a man of his time, um, and how he did things isn't the way that we would do things today. Um, some of these books, though, um, Don Stafford's Te Arawa is usually highly regarded. Um, again, it's about looking at the information in there and then doing further research. So with Tuwhiri Tour, looking at the information in there and finding further research, look at his footnotes. Where did he get his information from? All of that kind of stuff can help answer your particular question. Um, Paitohuri Jones was um, a very, very well-regarded man from Tainui. You know, so he he was a man from that particular um, iwi who was very well regarded and was was a leader. And his his quarter over there is brilliant. You know, it's it's, it's a great history of that particular iwi, um, and even better, it's it's bilingual. You know, um, so that's really interesting too. That can be a very useful resource. Uh, so, <clears throat> multi collection on the mezzanine floor. Um, there's going to be things on just on particular iwi, uh, but there's also going to be things on particular matters like land um, issues. There's going to be things on landmarks for particular ones. Tainui and Te Arawa, I think, uh, are these two that have books dedicated on particular landmarks within the Rohe. Um, you may find things based on home water, all sorts of stuff. You know, they're all going to be in that kind of Māori reference area. <clears throat> However, thankfully, we don't have to tie ourselves to the library catalogue and run around the library all day. Te Māori provides a heritage collection on the second floor that collects much of the material on local history, including Māori history, in one convenient space. However, the area also holds uh, other useful resources to supplement things found in the catalogue. So the Māori Land Court, um, we're quite lucky. Te Akamori has a, a fairly nice collection of Māori Land Court mini books, reproductions of mini books. Um, and mini books hold some amazing information. So they're the result of the Native Land Court. So the Native Land Court, now the Māori Land Court, caused complete havoc on Māori land tenure throughout the late 19th and 20th centuries. However, the court's constant interaction with Māori um, oh, left out a macro there. With Māori has left a, a record that is a unique and rich resource for place, iwi, hapu, and biographical information. The library has physical copies of a handful of um, local Māori Land Court minute books, as well as access to the Māori Land Court 
in a book database which you can get online using one of the computers or you can use on your phone it's free um, which is an index the late don stafford local historian has left notes typed up from various minute books which are also available and partially indexed um, inside the research room they're all in black folders there <clears throat> an understanding of how maori land came about can be helpful in navigating through the court record and that's with any system really um, understanding the archive system of the courts or the archive system of government um, although it can be a pain to get your head around is really useful because it'll help you navigate it and find things that would otherwise be forgotten somewhere otherwise be unfindable um, so understanding the system why the system acts the way it does why it was created um, it really does give you a big boost of being able to find what you're after um, because unfortunately archives aren't as easy as Google when finding things you know all right so just to give you an idea of what uh, Kōti Whenua Māori what the, the Māori land court the native land court did and the whole idea behind it um, is in this chart this is a chart that I've used before um, in some other presentations I've given uh, in regards to researching through the Māori land court and you'll find that video on currently I think it's still on um, the Rotorua library um, YouTube but anyway so originally um, all land in Aotearoa New Zealand was customary land um, which was land held under tikanga by iwi and hapu um, 1840 post 1840 that didn't really change the maori still owned their land um, ownership of land didn't change because of the treaty <clears throat> however if land was sold or land was taken for whatever reason um, then that stopped being customary land and it became crown land if it was taken by the crown or general land if it was purchased in 1865 um, there was this idea to convert customary land um, into something that was more akin to or similar to a European style of ownership of land. So something that would have the ownership, <clears throat> who the owners were, what shares they held in that land, um, and also a, a plan, a map, you know, of the area of that land, right? So the Native Land Court was set up in 62, between 62 and 65, and the whole idea of it and the whakaro behind it, besides some other issues, there were some other reasons why it was set up, um, which again you can see in my other presentation, but the main job of it was to take this customary land tenure and convert it into something more akin to European style. So once it went through this washing machine, which was the Native Land Court, it came out as essentially what is today Māori land, or what we call Māori freehold land today. Uh, Māori freehold land, <clears throat> if it was sold or taken, uh, if it was sold by the owners or taken by the Crown, today it would be Crown and General Land. If, however, the original owners and their successors still held on to it, it will still be known as Māori Freehold Title or Māori Land today. Right? So that's the difference between General Land and Māori Land. Right? They all come out of the same kind of um, system, um, but they have mm, different backgrounds. Right? Uh, so the, the Māori Land Court's main job is to look after Māori Freehold title today and it has all these records because of it. So there's this thing called the Māori Land Court Minute Book Index, an invaluable online database created by the University of Auckland. It indexes land blocks, <coughs> individual speakers, succession cases and other case types um, heard in the court between 1865 and 1910. So it's quite specific about the area it covers. Right? Um, and I think it actually does from 1862 when the when the court was first came into being, um, albeit on a smaller scale. And then it stops at 1910. So you can go to this database, you can bring it up at the library or as I say on your phone um, or at home, and you type in um, either an individual who might have spoken in the court at the time, uh, a person who died and was succeeded to at the time, or a particular land block that you're looking at. Um, and I don't mean the whole... If you know Māori land blocks, so I'm not, you don't put in Pukurua A147932, all of those numbers. Uh, it's better if you just put in the name of the block and then filter through. Uh, maybe the land the name of the block and the region, Māori land court region it's in, district it's in. Um, and that'll give you a, a whole bunch of references and minute books that you can then take, print out those references or copy them into a document and then go to the court or to the library and open those books up, book, book up, books up <laughs> and have a look through. And see what's in there you know um, so that, that's how you can read those references very very cool um, database the only um, issue being that it stops in 1910 so if you want to find things that happen from 1910 up until the modern era 
Um, there's a few other ways that you have to do it. That, that's a whole other issue. That's a whole other course. All right. References found on native land court minutes can also be found quoted or in footnotes in various books, studies, and Waitangi tribunal reports. You can use these references as well to help track information down. So perhaps you're reading through um, our niche, Nisha's um, book on carving, on Ngāti Tarawhai carving, and you read through, um, and I think there's, and part of it he talks about some of the houses that were carved at Makatu, just as an example. Uh, and he's taken some evidence from the native land court minute books where people were talking about when those were erected. Now, perhaps you want to read the whole thing. Rather than a quote, you want to read the whole thing. Um, you can then look at the footnote um, in the book, and it'll tell you a minute book number, and then it'll give you a minute book page. And you can take those to the library or to the native, uh, to the Māori Land Court, get that book and open it up and have a look at the original quote, and also get some idea about context and all of those kind of things as well. Same with Wai Waitangi Tribunal Reports. Um, often they'll refer to um, evidence that was given in the Native Land Court um, back in the day. If you want to have a look at that evidence, follow the footnote. All right, follow, follow footnotes. That's, um, again, it's one of the golden rules of research. So, <clears throat> moving past that kind of stuff. So perhaps you're looking for maybe an old place names, the exact placement of an old house or the former name of an old street. Copies of survey plans can do this and more. So while there's a survey, I've just taken this quote offline, survey plans show the legal boundaries of properties, including the appellation, that's to say the name, or legal description. Survey plans show the area and dimensions of a property. They include the observations that the surveyor made or calculated to define the property boundaries. These observations are made in relation to the surrounding properties and to the survey network of known marks. Uh, so today, LINS, or Land Information New Zealand, is the official agency that holds all of the original property surveys, or most of them. Um, however, the library also has a free digital set which can be used for research. Ask staff about it. So the, the staff have this, uh, the library has this cadastral uh, program that you can go into and you just need to put in the survey number that you're after and it'll spit it out um, and you can print them off or you can get it sent to you a digital copy so surveys are really interesting they have all sorts of information on them other non-property maps um, non-survey maps are also held by the library these can be historical road maps tourist maps council plans etc uh, if you want to have a look at these and see what they have ask staff for further information um, it is useful to know how to read plans and to understand that there are different types of plans. Uh, so what I've got here is a bit of a chart talking about the different types of plans. So the oldest group of plans that you'll tend to find is the ML plans or Māori land plans. These depict Māori land blocks, usually showing their legal boundaries. The area, partitions and roadways it might also show land takings or easements. The earliest plans, such as claimant plans attached to title investigation applications to the Native Land Corps, might show topographical details such as name landmarks, former settlements, cultivations, and urupa or cemeteries. So that's the ML plan series. Then there's the DP or DPS, which is the deposited plans. These depict land parcels on private subdivisions, usually general land. The survey might contain easements, road, roads to be declared, and reserves to be vested. Um, and most of the properties today, probably the property that you live in, if it's general land, um, has a DP or DPS plan attached to it. Sometimes you come across these oddities like LT or LTS plans, which are land transfer plans. Um, LT or LTS are temporary designations, precursors to DP plans that have been forwarded to LINs but are awaiting approval. Should they be approved, they become a DPS. Right. So you may come across some LT numbers and LTS numbers. Um, they may actually be DP now, so it's, it's a good idea just to have a check. Um, ESO or Survey Office Plans. These are used by government agencies and depict various Crown lands. They could be um, reserves, schools, um, lands taken for public purposes such as roads. Um, so these might be central government or they could be local councils. Right? As a general rule of thumb, the type of plan can also be a good indication of what status the land showing was at the time the survey was done. Therefore, if you've got an ML plan showing the area, likely to be Māori freehold land now. SO, like it needs to be Crown Land. DP or DPS, well, it's going to be General Land. There are exceptions to this, of course, and the status of land can change over time and might be shown as being different on a later survey. You know? So it's just going to tell you, at the time of the survey, what the status of that land is. You know? All right. Perhaps the hardest part is finding the correct reference for the land block or area you might be researching. 
in the pre-digital days, this meant looking through old records or large regional cadastral reference books for those magic numbers, right? Because the magic numbers is going to bring up the survey that you want. How do I find the number? However, today we can actually use free online information from LINS to find the current survey plan number for any location. So go here to that website there um, and click the property title layer or if it is crown land, use the New Zealand primary parcels layer. If you clicked one of those layers, it'll come up on the little map to the side. Um, and then if you use that map to zoom into whichever area you're looking at and then click on the map, um, there'll be a pop-up box. And the pop-up box will contain a number of details, including a plan number. So it's going to have probably the um, the CT, what we used to call the CT, but it's also going to have the plan number. And that's your golden ticket right there. That's the number that you need for that particular property. So you can go to Takamori pop that number into the new cadastral database to get a copy. But perhaps you're after an older or previous plan to the same area, maybe before it was subdivided. Just use any of the references found on the current plan, pop those into the cadastral database and inspect the resulting plan. Not what you're after, you just rinse and repeat. Right, and so what I mean about that I'll get to a little bit further on. So just show you some examples of um, some of the plans. This is an early um, ML plan, but in this case it's a, it's a claims plan. So this plan was created before um, the formalization of the title. It's when um, Māori essentially paid for a survey to kind of make a generic um, survey of the area so they could take it to the native land court to get it adjudicated upon. Um, so there'll be interesting things in this plan because this is the plan that would have been in front of the court at the time when witnesses were giving evidence. There may be numbers on there, and those numbers may correspond with the court at all that was happening in the court. Um, it's going to have landmarks in there that might have been spoken of in the court, all of those kind of things. Um, but the final title might have been a little bit different to this. You may find that there's a later plan for the same area after the court hearing that breaks it up into proper survey areas, survey parcels. So this is a claimant plan, but it is an email plan, a multi land plan. Uh, this is an SO plan. In this case, it's SO23558. Um, as I say, ASO plans were for government departments um, or local government groups. They tended to be schools or roads or um, certain roads or reservations. In this case, it's um, the Pukuroa and Quido Reserves. Um, and this one's really interesting. This is quite a unique plan because it's not often you get topographical plans. Um, but this is a topographical one of those particular areas. We can see um, the King George as it was then hospital um, and the area it took up. Um, but what's really interesting, or what I found really interesting, was we have Quido Park there. Um, and if you zoomed up, if you could actually, I don't know if you could see it, you probably can't, but if you zoomed up onto those um, bodies of water that you can see there, it actually has the original uh, Māori names on it uh, that was collected by the surveyor G.I. Martin um, at the time that he was um, surveying the area in the 30s. Um, so that's an example of an SO plan. Um, still in use today, SO plans uh, for government agency stuff. <clears throat> Um, this is an example of a DPS plan, DPS 40605, a subdivisional plan. This is a modern plan, this is what most plans are going to look like today, um, or a slight variation of this one today, um, showing as you can see there a subdivision of a land block and all the different subdivisions on it. All right, so DPS 40605. So let's have a look at the Ahuatanga, the anatomy, I suppose, of um, plants. So this is an old um, I think this is an old DP or DPS plan. Um, as you can see there, there's a few things on the plan. Um, just to the left-hand side there, you have um, a box, and in that box it's going to have something very, very useful, which is reference to former plans and field books. All right, so if, when surveyors would make this up, they'd have to compare to the previous plans before the subdivision happened to make sure they're getting everything right. So every plan that they looked at to create this plan, um, they should write, generally you should find it inside somewhere on the new plan. Right? It's going to have all these other numbers, and all these numbers are for the previous plan. So you can actually use those numbers to go check and have a look at the, what the area looked like previously before this subdivision actually happened. Very, very super important. It also has field books, <coughs> uh, which aren't available at Te Komodi, um, but they are available online. Um, and field books were just the notes that the surveyor took as they were surveying, uh, surveying up the area. You have the name of the survey of surveyor, of course. Um, you have reference to 
um, other subdivisions that happened um, possibly previously. You've got some DP numbers there. You have the, um, just at the right side there, you have subdivision um, scheme. Um, Town of Wolfatuda Extension, number 47. Um, again, Takamori is going to have information about that, but you could go to the local um, council uh, and in their archive, they may have some paperwork about it. Um, original Māori plan, uh, Māori, uh, sorry, original Māori land block appellation, or the original um, Māori name of this subdivision. So before I got all of these weird, cool DP names, um, legal names, DP, whatever numbers, um, this area was known as something else, and these plans. Um, actually show those old names now later subdivisions aren't going to show the multi name it's just going to be this particular plan but this can be quite useful when you're researching because you can say ah oh, this was called Orfa to the south number three block um, i can now go to the multi land court and look up the records for that block there um, ct or legal title identification you can see there those ct numbers those are the numbers that you can take to lens and lens can give you copies um, you have to pay though um, will give you copies of those CTs, and those CTs will reveal to you who the owners were um, at the time of those CTs. Yeah, um, and then we have our plan number at the bottom there. This is an older version, um, but this is more the modern version. Same kind of stuff though. You know, you still have um, some references on the, on the plan itself to other plans, like SO plans for the road. Um, we have a whole bunch of legal titles or CTs, what used to be called CTs, um, in the box on the right. We still have the surveyors named. Um, super importantly, we have the formal plans that make up this survey, so we can take those plans, put them into the cadastral database at Takamodi, and look at those plans as well. You can see there we have, um, there's a DP plan, um, but oh, there's also an ML plan, ML20, what's that, 205? 20564, so we can type that into cadastral and have a look at the multi plan. Um, and it may give us some interesting details as well. Um, we have the appellation, the name of the blocks, we have the survey company, we have the date of the plan, and of course the DPS number 40605. Right, so that's Native Land Court, Multi Land Court plans that can be also useful. Um, and then we have the Waitangi Tribunal database. So Luckily, the Takabodi holds um, uh, a whole bunch of files from the Waitangi Tribunal, quite a bit actually. Um, and these files come from different investigations that have happened. Uh, some of them are full files, like the CNI inquiry is the, the entire CNI, Central North Island collection. Um, some of them are only partial because they're quite old. Um, so the Kaituna inquiry that happened for the Kaituna. Um, uh, that I can tell to the earlier quarry, all of those kind of things. There's only bits and pieces in there. But for the latest ones, like the CNI, it's got everything that happened during the CNI inquiry that happened back in 2005 ish. Um, so it's got all of the reports that historians made for that particular inquiry. Um, if you're really lucky, it's got even their research notes and, and copies of the um, research that they did. Um, it'll have evidence that was given by individuals. So some of our core here might have given evidence um, that'll be recorded there. Um, transcripts sometimes there's transcripts of of, of um, cordial that was given um a whole bunch of legal stuff is usually thrown in there all the prep memos that um lawyers put in and all that kind of stuff usually aren't very interesting um usually the more interesting stuff uh, briefs of evidence and stuff that were given by individuals or um just the outlines of of, of white tongue claims by lawyers it could be really interesting for information anyway so that's cni we also have a few we also have the two hoi one um, at Te Akamodi, um, which has a similar huge amount of information in it as well um, that was used for that. And I think we might, and the King Country one, um, the Rohi Portai investigation, as well as I think Tauranga Moana. All right. So it's a, it's a complete treasure trove of stuff, um, of research that other people have done that may touch on your research question, you know, um, or at least be in the area of your research question. So it may help scaffold you um, to, to where you need to be. So, I'm not going to go through that whole thing now, Waitangi Tribunal, but if you go to this YouTube address, um, it's a video that I've done for Te in the past regarding the Waitangi Tribunal. Uh, please have a look at it. It's a, it's a great database. It's definitely underused, um, and it just provides so much information. If you can't um, follow this link here, um, if you just go to YouTube and go to Te or Rotorua Library um, account, you'll see that it's um, one of the many videos that are in there, all right? So Waitangi Tribunal, of course, is the tribunal set up um, to hear claims, and out of those claims, a number of reports are written 
for both the crown and for um, for the iwi. You know, so you can get a lot of um, really cool different quarter ones inside those files. Right, so check it out. Definitely check it out. Um, you can only access it on site at Te Akamori. Right, now local newspapers. So local uh, historical newspapers are full of interesting tidbits unavailable elsewhere, including land court proceedings, government hui with iwi, death notices and more. Past Papers is a wonderful website, but it has its limitations. It only has certain newspapers and only up to a certain time frame. So if you research from home, you may have come across Past Papers, which has a whole bunch of um, imaged newspapers from all over Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is really cool. Um, really easy to search through because you can just search by word. Um, but as I say, Takamori has the more localised collection and it doesn't stop at a certain point in time. It's all the way up until current. So Tiakamori has um, all these newspapers that I've written here to those particular dates. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great resource. Newspapers are a fantastic resource. Um, the issue we have with Rotorua, which is a unique issue to us, is that um, we have a very large hole in the collection from the 18, mid-1800s, uh, mid, not 1800s, mid-1880s, um, up until about 1930, 1940. Um, no one knows exactly why. It's a, it's a bit of a local mystery, but um, all those newspapers from those particular era era are missing, completely gone. Um, some theories are there may have been a fire or a business closed down and destroyed those newspapers. Whatever the case may be, um, we're left with a few strands, um, a handful of newspapers from the era. But hey, from the 1930s, 1940s up, all of those newspapers are there. right? Um, searching through them can be hard because there's no... Google like interface you can go through um, and it's all on microfilm type stuff so you have to sit in front of the machine and, and, and read through them um, which in itself can be actually really really interesting because you get all that local news and stuff um, but it does take time it's time consuming essentially so you know if you can use one of the other resources to narrow down your dates um, that's what you need you know if you can find some something in a Maori land court record or a birth death and marriage record and it can narrow the date down for you that's the way to do it. Maybe your tupuna died at a certain date in 1948. Cool, that narrows the search down that you need to make in the newspapers to find out some information about that person and their death, right? All of those kind of things. So, so they're all building blocks, you know, they all help each other. Um, further, the late Don Stafford has an extensive collection of newspaper clippings grouped into subjects in the Don Stafford um, room. So in the research room upstairs, there's a whole bunch of folders there um, and there are essentially clips you know parts taken extracts taken from newspapers from local newspapers from the bay of plenty as well as um, Rotorua. Um, and they're all by subject so you know it's, it's really useful you know there's one on roads there's one on schools um there's biographical ones as well um and you just pull those out and read through them might you might have your person in there you know the one that you're looking for all right so for the kind of bringing it together because um it takes a whole bunch of sources to answer your question, right? A whole bunch of sources. Um, hopefully they can all be answered by stuff that's held by Tiakamodi. Um, but you're probably going to need some information from outside as well. But it's joining these sources together are the things which are going to answer your query, your question, right? Uh, so it might take one or more of these sources to assist or guide you towards the answer for your question or questions. And it's likely that Tiakamodi might only be the start of the journey, not the end. So here's an example of one. Um, did my iwi, in this case Te Arawa, sign the treaty? So I had a look at um, A History of Te Arawa People by Don Stafford and also looked at a book called The Beating Hearts. So reading through them, I discovered, no, no, Te Arawa didn't sign the treaty. Um, but hey, I also had a look at um, this book Pukaki by um, Professor Paul Tapsel, or Paul Tapsel, um, and he quotes some chiefs that actually visited Kohi Marama, Te Arawa chiefs, uh, Ngāti Whakaui as well, um, who visited Kohi Marama during the Kohi Marama conference in 1860. Um, and there they actually spoke about the treaty um, and actually aligned themselves with some of the principles of the treaty and things like that. So that's interesting. So no didn't sign it at the time, refused to sign it according to the stories that are in there. Um, but later on, um, you know, kind of aligned themselves to some of those principles of the treaty. Um, but geez, I really wanted to find out in the Te Arawa book um, and in the Beating Hearts book, they talk about the Hiu Hiu, um, the chief coming up to Rotorua um, when the missionaries were, were getting people to sign the treaty and, and him saying, no, I don't want to sign. You know? 
Um, and so they say that that kōrero actually comes from um, a text that was written by one of the other te hiuhus, um early last century. And so when I was looking through the Waitangi Tribunal papers, I found a copy of that, um, a copy of that particular text, which had been copied out of some archives um, to help support another report. Right, so that was really cool. I got to read through the text to kind of understand um, why he said no and where that, where that story of no had actually come from. I also had found, um, and then the Te Aroha Boko talked about some chiefs who had signed the treaty, um, but had done it while they were away, you know, while they were away from the iwi, so weren't authorised to sign it on behalf of Te Aroha. they just happened to be with their wives, people, peoples at the time, um, signed it along with the, uh, with the Zindals. Now, going through some minute books, I actually found a reference to um, a cordial where one of the chiefs talks about... Um, uh, one of the other chiefs of, of Ngāti Whakau in particular signing the treaty while they were with Ngāti Pukeko, um, with the Ngāti Awa people, because his wife was from there. Um, and, it, and it talks about how this particular chief had signed the treaty while he was away. You know, So through those resources, um, no. But later on, the line with some of the principles of the treaty, um, and actually one of the iwi did sign it, um, but he signed it with his people. Um, and what I could have also added in here was from another book on the Te Aroha Monument at Government Gardens. Um, it actually shows um, a representation of that chief who had signed um, that treaty, which you'll actually see there carved into the stone um, uh, with Hobson apparently watching him. All right. So, you know, th that, that answers my question, doesn't it? But it also gives me some new questions and... Um, some context and all of that kind of stuff in regards to that one question. So with your question, it might be the same thing. It might be you might find the answer in one book or you may find multiple answers in, in, in books and newspapers. You know, it's all about using those various threads, Fidi at the Kaha, bringing them together um, to give you an idea of what happened in the past, right? So there's some tools of the trade. I, I also did this for... Um, Māori land court research, but this one's particular to um, to researching at Te Akamori. There's some tools of the trade that you should always have with you as a researcher. Um, one resource is a high quality camera, mobile phone, preferably with a PDF type application that can turn pictures in the PDFs, or a DSLR standalone camera, um, or a mirrorless camera, whichever, whichever camera you want to use. It just has to be good quality so you can take pictures of um, what you find. There may be um, Back in the day, eh, we used to do we used to uh, photocopy, photocopy everything, you know, twenty cents a copy or whatever. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to try and wedge that book into the photocopy machine and fight with the photocopy machine and find correct change and all of that kind of stuff, right? We all have um, photocopy machines in our hands with our mobile phones, right? So you might be looking at a, a minute book or you might be looking at a book um, or you might be looking at a report. Um, just copy it. You can copy the page or pages that you're after, right? So the days of photocopying, copious amounts of pages is gone. Quickly capture large amounts of documents, records, and photographs, etc. Uh, make sure you have your stationery, pens, copy paper, line, refill paper, or scrap paper. Um, pens and line paper to take research notes, right? And scribble little notes. Try and be nice and clear with your notes. You don't want to be like me, go back to your notes and go, ooh, that, that looks like a dot to dot. I don't actually know what I meant, right? So try and keep it clean, but you should have a paper with you all the time. Um, your notes or whānau papers, remember to bring any research notes or whānau papers that might prove useful, um, they might have got off whānau. Have a laptop or an iPad or whatever, which could prove useful to either take notes or access Māori Land Online or other useful databases if you have an internet connection, which you will have at Tekamodi because it's free. Right. Maybe bring a mate, can be useful to break up the work and throw ideas and give a fresh um, perspective or point of view. Rules of engagement, uh, library staff. So try your best to be sh uh, to build strong, friendly, personal relationships with staff. Remember, they too can be a useful resource, just like anything else in Te Akamori. And hey, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. All right, it's easy to be nice, easy as. Um, to understand that the staff counts can be very busy, be armed with patience. Um, so especially on a uh, heritage floor, um, sometimes the research desk can be very busy. Uh, so it's just about um, waiting around, waiting for whoever's to be served to be served. And waiting your turn. All right. Uh, staff do not have the capacity to undertake in-depth research work on your behalf. 
And you know what? The fact is no one will work harder or strive further than you on your inquiry. All you need is basic understanding of the tools to use and understanding your stuff can train you on. And understanding of that stuff can train you on. Um, you know, so going up and saying, oh, can you find my papa?" You know, that's um, that's not cool. <laughs> that really isn't. Um, they, don't have, they don't really have time to go in depth with it, but they'll help you as much as they can with the time that they have and the resources they have. Even then, you're the best person to research your take, your kaupapa. You are. You're the one that's going to have the emphasis, um, the power, the energy, hopefully the time. Um, you're going to look in places that other people just won't look, right? You're not going to look at just the superficial stuff because you, you've you got a passion for it. It's your kaupapa. You're going to go the extra mile. You always go the extra mile, more so than anyone else, unless you pay a researcher, <laughs> right? You will always go more deeper than any staff member is going to. All they can do is provide you some of the avenues um, and some of the sources that are available, yeah? A library clientele. Um, you can set up your laptop and notebooks in any number of places in the library. Uh, be aware of your space and surroundings. Don't be the person who has the equipment everywhere or who hogs one of the printers or photocopiers all day um, or a power supply or what have you, you know? Um, just be mindful of your fellow researchers, of your fellow library users, all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, your fellow researchers and library users are usually very friendly. How be respectful of people's privacy, right? Some people they want to talk, they might be doing something very, very private in regards to their research. Uh, make careful use of whatever physical resources you have. Treat them as the tonga that they are. So even though it's copies of minute books, native land called minute books that you'll find at Te Akamori, treat them with the respect that the knowledge that they convey um, and the resource that they are for other people. Um, yeah, so you know, just be careful with them. Even especially with old books, you're going to find a lot of old books in Te Akamori, um, long out of print. Be careful with them. You know, treat them, treat them with respect. Copy them with your phone. Just copy the pages that you need. Um, and then that way you can just read it on your iPad, hey, on your ePopper, or you can read them on your computer. All right, can't play. And then it's good luck, and off you go. Um, so tera, tera. Um, we'll, we've arrived at the end of it. Hopefully I've given you an idea of what's available. There's, there's other sources. I haven't gone in depth in um, a few of the resources that are in there. Um, but those guys, the guys at the library, they will help you. All right, they're going to help you find your book. They're going to help you... Um, research things out they're going to help you understand what's out there and what's available to you um, you know and this is just as I say this is just your first step so good luck with with um, whatever it is that you're researching um, you know it's it's be methodical um, ask questions all of those kind of things uh, and it'll come to you um, in the Maori research world sometimes we, we say that um, and I've talked to other researchers about this sometimes you'll hit a roadblock sometimes you'll hit something that's really really difficult for whatever reason um, you know you've tried all these sources you've tried everywhere you've looked everywhere and you just haven't been able to move forward take a take a rest hey take a wafakata uh, take a moment take a breath put it aside maybe work on something else for a while and then go back to it it's amazing what a bit of rest does um, you know, maybe it's it's just not the right time for you to know that yet. Um, maybe you do need to take that break, uh, get a new head, or be in the right space or the right circumstances. Um, so give it a break and then go back, and you'll find that um, ninety nine percent of the time, um, that at some point when you do go back, um, it'll suddenly become easier for some reason. Right? That's just the nature of research. All right. So good luck with you. Um, if you have any issues, you know, talk to staff. Um, I may be able to help you. Just ask staff, and, and they can put you in contact with me. All right. So, Matiwa, um, and happy hunting. <laughs>